Shabbat Shalom, child of the Most High King. Welcome to this week's Shabbat Table Mana and Torah portion study. So thank you for joining us today and it's my prayer that our hearts will be set on hearing the Father's voice today as He speaks to us, as He teaches us His truths and His revelations. So our reading Torah reading today is from Numbers 19 verse 1 to Numbers 22 verse 1. We also uh, would read Judges 11 verse 1 to 33, Hebrews 9 from 11 to 22, Hebrews 13 verses 10 to 13, John 4 verse 10 and 14, and John 7 verse 37. So the portion or our reading for this week is called Chukat. And it means decree or making a decree and an ordinance. So we continue with this book of Numbers and we are still in the wilderness because of disobedience and rebellion and the people not trusting Abba Yah. It's people that look at their circumstances, they look at their comfortable lives, they look at what they have and they doubt the Father. And therefore they did not enter the promised land as we studied two weeks ago. And then an uprising happened that Korach led. And so we get back to the same question that we've been asking since our studies in Leviticus started. What is our faith founded on? Is it guided by truth of what Yeshua has done or is it guided by our own pride and uplifting of ourselves? You see, our faith life can be built upon the rock. Where we really realize it is not out of our own power or out of our own might, but because He overcame death. Because he overcame the grave and through his resurrection, through his victory, now you and I, now, now we can be more than overcomers. We can have victory in our lives. So do we confess with our mouths that he is the son of the living Yah or do we live it as well? You see, child of the Most High, we must understand one thing. Do we believe what we confess? If so, then our faith should proclaim what we believe. The way we love should proclaim what we talk and what we teach, what we confess with our mouths. Because faith is about confessing and proclaiming. In other words, my brothers and sisters, faith is about speaking forth the truth of who Abba Yahuwah is and what His Son Yeshua has come and did for us. So we spoke last week about Korach and the rebellion he led against Moses and Aaron um, with the 250 elders and Datan and Avriam. And we saw that Korach actually rebelled not against Moses and Aaron, but he rebelled against the Father because Abba Yah raised Moses and Aaron up as his uh, leaders, as his high priest. And so we learned last week that pride and strife and my own selfish or fleshly lusts or desires removes me from the presence of the Father. We learned that we are supposed to be humble and to submit under the Father's authority and not the authority of the people. In other words, even if you and I are not called by the Father to do something, then we shouldn't do it. Even if the people want you and me to stand up and be the pastor, but if you're not called to be the pastor, then don't do it. If you're not called to be the leader of the counselors, then don't do it. If you're not called to be the prophet or the teacher or the uh, apostle or the evangelist, then don't do it. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, you and I, we call to be a bond servant. And a bond servant serves in love. 
Sometimes we should just be that bond servant. So we are to seek the Father's will in our lives above all. And so we get to this week's parasha or Torah portion reading. And it is like I said, it's called shukat. It means to, uh, to decree, to, to, to make an ordinance. In other words, it's giving a declaration or command that we are supposed to do. You see, with a degree, a uh, decree, sorry, it requires obedience. In fact, obedience is expected. So do not ask questions why, just do it, my son. That is what Father is teaching us. So now, my brothers and sisters, I want to, I, I want to take you back when, when, when you were just a child in your father's house. I remember for myself till this day, and I'm 47 years old now, I remember some of my father's rules and instructions. For example, if, if I wanted to go out with my friends on a weekend, then I had to mow the lawn. Or I had to work in the garden or wash his cars and so many other instructions that I, and along with my brothers and sisters, that we all had to follow, we all had to obey. And yes, some of these rules or instructions did not always make sense to me as a child, and then obviously there were those rules that's more obvious, that's, that's easy to interpret and to understand what needs to be done. You see, we had to obey the rules and instructions that my father had in his house, whether we understood it or not, whether we thought it's fair or not, we had to obey. Or else there would have been punishment. You see, in this Torah portion reading, we see a few of these decrees or ordinances or commands that's given that we do not always understand why, but we have to obey it. We have to change. We have to adapt. We have to follow what was given. And so here in this Torah portion, Chukat, we see some of these instructions or laws. And because we love the Father, we're not going to ask why. We're just going to study His Word and we're going to rely on the Ruach, His Holy Spirit, to teach us and to show us. So, Chukat in Hebrew means, like I've said earlier, a decree or an ordinance. So, what is an ordinance? In simple terms, it is an instruction that comes from someone who has the authority to give it. Or even who has the authority over you and me to tell us what we should do. In other words, it's an authoritative order. I want you to understand this. It's like a president of a country that would issue an executive order. How many times have we heard uh, prime ministers or uh, presidents of countries issues and executive orders? So this means that this instruction or this order from this president or this person in charge, this leader, would be law for this country immediately. No questions asked. So it will be enforced. So the people of the country must do, they must obey. And we, here we find some of these ordinances given by the Father. And it's a lot of places in the Bible, these ordinances are given. Instructions are given by the Father. Some are obvious and some are not. For example, when we study, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie. So it's obvious, it's understandable. But then we get to one of those that we're going to do today that's not so easy to understand. We might not uh, know why the Father is saying that, but that's the way it is. We must just understand it and we must just obey it. Now within this parasha of this Torah portion reading, there's a lot of symbolism and shadow types of what Yeshua did and what He's still going to do for you and me. 
So this portion talks about the red heifer. We'll be reading about living water, the death of Miriam and Aaron, and then we read about Moses that was instructed to speak to the rock to get the water for the people. But he struck the rock twice. But in this Shabbat table manner, what you and I will be talking about today is just the red heifer and the ashes. So sacrificing is an instruction from the Father. And here we see the priest who does the sacrifice becomes unclean. So that's one of the questions why we could ask, but why is this? We don't understand this, but this is a decree given by the Father. The priest who does the sacrifice becomes unclean. So the priest who presents this offer to the Father becomes unclean. But the ashes of the red heifer, that purifies the people. So why is that? Sometimes we must look with our spiritual eyes when Father gives us an instruction. Sometimes we must ask the Ruach, the, 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 the set-apart Spirit of the Father to show us and to teach us. So that we can understand, so that we can be obedient. You see, we need to be obedient without questioning the Father. And we must understand this. We can always ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and show us and teach us. But we should never become disobedient by questioning the Father why He instructs us to do stuff. If we do not understand, my brother and sister, then just be obedient and do it. Because it will be revealed to you and me sooner or later. We are not called to be slaves. We are called to be bond servants. And bond servants serve us in love. So because we want to serve our Heavenly Father with all our hearts, with all our souls, as we are instructed in 1 Samuel 12, 24, therefore we will be obedient. Torah obedience, or being obedient, is an act of love. It does not always make sense, but because we seek His heart, therefore we want to obey. So in this parasha, we will see the red heifer sacrifice and also what the ashes was used to, or what it was used for. And why was the ashes so important? You see, we spoke about Korach and the uprising, and their deaths, and the deaths of the elders, and so many Israelites that died on that very same day. So there was a lot of death in the camp. Which means defilement. Death in the camp means uncleanliness. And so the people that had to remove these corpses, remove all these dead people, they became unclean. Because from Leviticus studies, we know when we come in contact with the dead, then we become unclean. So death is unclean. The corpses is unclean. So we have a situation where those around the dead or touching the dead in the camp became unclean. So there needed to be a purification. There needed to be something to clean the people with. So let's, if you will, read with me Numbers 19, verse 1 to 9. Numbers 19 Verse 1 to 9. And Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, This is a law of the Torah which Yah has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer, a perfect one, in which there is no blemish and on which a yoke has never come. And you shall give it to Eliezer the priest, and he shall bring it outside the camp and shall slay it, before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with its finger and sprinkle some of the blood seven times toward the front of the tent of appointment. In other words, the sanctuary or the tabernacle. 
and the heifer shall be burnt before his eyes. He burns its hide, its flesh, and its blood, and its dung. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and throw them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. The priest shall then wash his garments and shall bath his body in water and afterward come into the camp. But the priest is unclean until evening. And he who is burning, it washes, and he who is burning, it washes his garments in water and shall bath his body in water and is unclean until evening. And an unclean man shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and a clean man sorry shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and shall place them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of uncleanliness it is for cleansing from sin can we see what we are reading here today we're talking about death of the in the camp but here the father say it's for the Cleansing from sin. Now, as we already started learning and seeing here in these verses that a female red heifer cow had to be sacrificed outside of the camp. When we study the laws of sacrifices, then we see the red heifer was slaughtered and skinned and cut into four pieces. And then this red heifer would be placed on an altar outside of the camp. And be completely burned up. All the meat, the hide, the hooves, the intestines. Yes, everything had to be burned up completely. And the ashes would then be mixed with water. And this would then be sprinkled on the people who became or who, uh, defiled because they came in contact with the dead. And here we see the Father says it's from the cleansing from sin. So the priest had to dip his fingers into the blood and sprinkle it seven times in the direction of the tabernacle. The entire animal, including, like I said, everything had to be burned up completely on an altar outside of the camp in a supervision of being supervised by the priest. While this animal was burning, the priest had to add three items, cedar wood, hyssop, and a scarlet yarn into the fire. And we're going to see this picture as well today. The priest then had to immerse himself in water. He had to mix for himself. He had to baptize himself to be called cleaned by the evening again. And so we start to see the typology or the pictures of how we are unclean because of sin. Because as we will study today, we will see that sin brings death. So all this death in the camp was because of sin. What sin? The people questioned the Father. The people came in uprising against Abba Yah. The people rebelled against the Father. So therefore there was sin in the camp. Therefore Red Heifer had to be uh, sacrificed and the ashes to be used to, be, uh, to cleanse the people. So the people were in sin. Because as we'll study today, we will see that sin brings death, like I said. Sin removes us from the presence of the Father. Sin takes us from this... Uh, from, from the Father's light into darkness. And over and over we are taught in the word of Yah that we must be clean if we want to enter into His presence. Just like Israel had to be clean to enter into the sanctuary or the tabernacle, so you and I have to be clean to be in the presence or to be able to go into the presence of the Father. Why is that? Because darkness and light does not mix. So the red heifer is this picture that righteousness is available for you and me, my brother and sister. 
when we have sinned, purification is available for you and me. Why is that? Well, let's look at the distinctive features of this red heifer ceremony. So this is the only offer or sacrifice that had to be offered anywhere but the brazen altar that is in the camp. So we see the priest had to take the red heifer outside the camp and just the same, our Messiah was sacrificed outside of the city. This is the only female sacrifice that could be sacrificed and this represents, this female cow represents the bride. It represents Israel. In all other sacrifices, the priest does not become tamai, the priest does not become unclean or defiled, but here they do. And just the same, our Messiah that uh, took our sin upon him, so he became unclean. He became sin on our behalf. He took our sin on him. And then we see the ashes of the red heifer brings purification in just the same way the death and the blood of Yeshua brings our purification. Can we see the shadow of Yeshua in the red heifer today? Can we see how the purification from death is the Messiah on the cross from you and me? So instead of being removed from the Father because of defilement, because of sin, Yeshua brings us purification. Yeshua is the door to the Father. Yeshua is the way to the Father. Because the only way to get to the Father is through Yeshua. So we need to get purification from Him. You see, Yeshua brings us into the presence of Yah. And so we must be clean. So therefore he died for our sins so that through a repent of heart, my brother and sister, through you and me that repent of our sins, we turn from our wicked ways with the Shuva, so we too can enter through Yeshua to the presence of the Father. We read in Romans 3, 24 uh, to 25, For all have sinned and fall short of the esteem or the glory of Elua, being declared right without pain by His favor through the redemption which in Messiah Yeshua from Elua set forth as an atonement through belief in His blood. Can we see? Through belief in His blood to demonstrate His righteousness because in His tolerance Elua had passed over the sins that had taken place before. We read Ephesians 5 verse 2, And walk in love as Messiah also has loved us and gave himself for us a gift and an offering to Alua for a sweet smelling fragrance. Wow! 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, Therefore cleanse out the old leaven, and we, we know leaven is sin. So he says, Therefore cleanse out the sin so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened, for also Messiah, our Pesach, our Passover, was slaughtered for us. Romans 2 verse 1. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elua, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elua, your reasonable worship. So we see what is needed for us for salvation and purification. So we need to repent, my brother and sister. We need to come to the altar. We need to approach Yeshua. We need to ask Him to cleanse us, to remove sin from us. As we remember from our studies in Leviticus, and as we always continue to study to understand the purpose of being clean. In other words, to be spiritually clean is to be able to worship the Father. And so to be unclean means that we must be purified. We must be restored to the presence of the Father. 
to be restored to the presence of Abba Yah means, listen, it means we are restored to worship. So there's a process of cleansing. And the red heifer is part of this process of cleansing that we will see today, child of Yah, this cedarhood, this hyssop, this scarlet yarn, that represents you and me, and that's, and that's been put into the fire with this red heifer. So you and I need to go through the fire as well. You and I need to repent as well. You see, we should not get stuck, stuck in this idea of physical sacrifices anymore, like we are learning about the red heifer. We need to see the spiritual picture of Messiah on the cross dying for our sins. We need to see the uh, picture of you and I that need to go through the fire. We need to be purified by fire. You and I, my brother and sister, we need cleansing. We need restoration. And that we only get through fire. That we only get through Messiah. He is the way. And that you and I must understand today. You see, we must understand the reason for cleansing and restoration. And, and we must understand how the Father wants things to be done. And what He wants done. In biblical times, this sacrificial act was called a ceremony. So what is a ceremony according to the Bible, according to the word of Yah? So firstly, we must understand that sacrifices are, or, or offerings is a divine institution. It's given by the Father Himself. Biblical sacrifices is not man-made. In other words, the instructions comes from Abba Yah and not from a man. Abba himself instructs us to sacrifice as an act of worship. And this should be a joyous occasion. You see, my brother and sister, for you and me to sacrifice ourselves is to lay ourselves down. In the other words, it's for you and me to be less, to become nothing so that the Father can be everything. Can we see this today? Laying all our sins and our pride down at the altar so that that can be burned away. So therefore, as we've studied before, we have five types of sacrifices that spiritually prepares you and me so that we can be cleansed, so that we can be restored to the presence and the will and the purpose of the Father. You see, so that we can submit ourselves humbly before the Father. For the purpose you and I have been created is to worship Him. You see, when we lay ourselves down, we no longer worship ourselves, but we worship Him. We no longer want to be um, everything that I can be, everything that Francois can be, or what the world wants me to be. No, no. When I lay myself down, I become who the Father wants me to be. You see, child of Yah, that is true worship. It's to be who He wants us to be. The whole idea of all these sacrificial acts the whole idea of the red heifer is for us to see the Messiah, Yeshua, in our lives. To see what He has done for us. To see that He is the door that leads to the Father. Sacrifice is an act of faith. And it leads us to a place of worship and to the presence of the Father. You see, child of Yah. Our sacrificial acts, our restoration to the Father starts with acknowledging our iniquities. It starts with you and me acknowledging our sin. And we then start the process of cleansing by repentance. So this ceremony of the red heifer is a foretelling or a shadow of the cleansing, the atonement what Messiah, or Messiah Yeshua brought, why He came to earth. 
We also saw that the priest who does the sacrifice and all those who are involved in the ceremony becomes unclean. Just like Messiah took our sin on him for our sake, so he became sin. He became unclean. We read how the father turned his face away from Messiah. You see, so that cleanliness so that cleansing and purification can happen through the blood and the death of Messiah. We read in, in Isaiah 53 verse 47, Truly, He has borne our sickness and carried our pains. Yet we reckoned Him smitten, stricken by a lure, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookedness. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep went astray, each one of us has turned to his own way, and Yah has laid on him the crookedness of us all. Can we see this? All our sin was laid on Messiah. He became unclean. He became defiled because of our sin. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. But he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shearer. He is silent. But he did not open his mouth. And then we read Romans 5, 19. For as through the disobedience of one man... Many were made sinners. So it's talking about Adam. Ne? So also through the obedience of one man, talking about Messiah Yeshua, many shall be righteous. Wow. What an amazing picture of what Messiah came and did for us through this red heifer. Red heifer in, in Hebrew means para aduma. Para aduma. Para means heifer. But it also means breaking forth of strength. Listen, breaking forth of strength. So it's breaking someone's strength. Strength. It's to be broken. That is what hefer. That's that's the meaning of para. It's to be broken. Aduma is red. In Hebrew, it can also mean adom. And Adam, we mean, we know, comes from Adam, and Adam is man. So para aduma can imply man needs to be broken. Can we see this? Our own selfish acts, our own selfish needs and lustful desires needs to be broken. Because we need to become like Messiah. Just like Yeshua was broken, you and I need to be broken. My brothers and sisters, we need to be broken from our stubbornness and our hard-headedness. So we as men get our cleansing, we get our purification by laying ourselves down, laying everything we are, everything we want, everything we need, laying all of that down. Everything I am as a man, my fleshly desires, my pride and my strife to be completely laid down. In other words, completely burned away by the consuming fire of Abba Yah, so that we can be purified. So through this process, like this red heifer, through this ceremony, we are cleansed. So here we see the making of the ashes of the red heifer defiles the person. But the sprinkling of the ashes of the red heifer purifies a person. Through the death of Messiah on the cross, we now get our purification. Through the death of the red heifer on the altar outside the camp, these ashes or the ashes of the red heifer brings purification. Through you and me laying ourselves down at the feet of the altar, 
through you and me laying ourselves down, being burned away by the consuming fire of the Father, we receive purification. So only one person that was truly without sin could take away the sin of the world. Just like the red heifer cow had to be without spot and blemish, Messiah was without spot and blemish. We read again Numbers 19 verse 1 to 2. And Yah spoke to Moshe and Aaron saying, This is a law. In other words, this is a decree of the Torah which Yah has commanded saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer. Listen, a perfect one in which there is no blemish and on which a yoke has never come. Without defect is the Hebrew concordance number 85. Four nine eight five four nine H eight five four nine. It means integrity. To be perfect in our ways, to speak with truth, to be without spot, to stand upright and whole. It means to be complete in Messiah. No blemish is the Hebrew concordance number H three nine seven one. It means no. Stain, no physical or moral stain. Spiritually pure and clean, my brothers and sisters. No sin. Then we also read, um, on which a yoke has never come. So this animal should not have been yoked. It means this animal's should not have been submitted to the bondage of man. This animal should not have been uh, submitted under the control of man, under the uh, work of any man. In other words, not conformed to this world, not conformed to man's opinions. You and I, my brothers and sisters, according to Romans 12, 1 and 2, we should not be conforming to the world or uh, the religious acts or uh, the cultures of this world. Now we should conform to Messiah Yeshua. You see, because we see that Yeshua never conformed. He never conformed to the teachings of the Pharisees and the scribes. In fact, he tried to teach them the truth of Torah. And we know so many times Messiah Yeshua said that he only speaks what his father told him to speak. He only do what he saw his father did. And so Yeshua took on his father's yoke. Yeshua did not take on the yoke of man. Yeshua did not take on the yoke of this world. Just like this red heifer should not have been yoked, Messiah was not yoked. He was not yoked by this world. We read in 1 Timothy 6, verse 13 to 14, In the sight of Elua who gives life to all, and of Messiah Yeshua who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you that you guard the command spotlessly, blamelessly, until appearing of our Master Yeshua Messiah. Can we see this? Follow the command spotlessly, blamelessly. Do not be yoked by this world. Do not be yoked by religions. Do not be yoked by opinions. Can we see how you and I are called as believers in Messiah, as followers of truth, to put on the yoke of Messiah? To be spotless and blameless. To be in obedience of His word. We read in 2 Peter 3.14 so then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Jeremiah 30 verse 8, And it shall be in that day, declares Yahweh, that I break, listen, his yoke from your neck, and tear off your bonds, and foreigners no more enslave you. 
In other words, brothers and sisters, Father is saying that a day will come. He's talking, this is a prophecy of what is to come. He says, a day will come when He will break the yoke of our oppressors. He will break the yoke of Babylon. That's why we are told, get out of Babylon. So just like He broke the yoke of Egypt on the children of Israel, Father is saying He will break the yoke of Babylon. Again, this is an end time prophecy, but child of Yah, we can now already start to move out from under this yoke of this world. We can move out from under this yoke of the people. We do not need to conform to this, to this world and its opinions. By submitting ourselves under the yoke of the Father, you and I, when you and I follow His will and His purpose, then we move out from the yoke of this world. You see, Son of the Most High, Daughter of the Most High King, following His instructions, being Torah obedient, being obedient to His command, you and I take on His yoke. And we not under the yoke of this world. It starts with obedience to the instructions of the Father. Listen, not because it's a matter of life and death, because it is. But that's not the reason why we are obedient. Because that makes us lawful. That makes us uh, being bound by the law. No, we follow and we are obedient because of law or because of love. We follow the Messiah. We take His yoke upon us because of love. Because we love Him. Galatians 5 verse 1, it says, In the freedom with which Messiah has made us free, stand firm then, and do not again be held by yoke of slavery. You see, the commands of men enslaves us. The opinions of men enslaves us. The commands of this world enslaves us. But the yoke of the Father sets us free from slavery. Like I said earlier, bond servants serve out of love, not because they're slaves. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Do not become even unevenly yoked with unbelievers, for with partnership, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness, and what fellowship has light with darkness? So understand this. We yoked by the Father out of love, not out of guilt. We yoked by the Father because we love Him, not because we stuck in some um, uh, religious ways or some religious practices or some sacrificial practices. No, we yoked by the Father because we love Him. We set free from slavery because we love Him. You see, child of Yah, we should not be like unbelievers. We should not be lukewarm, saying and confessing that we child of the Most High, children of the Most High, but we seek wisdom from men, seeking all kinds of false spiritual worship, seeking acceptance from men. But we should take on the yoke of righteousness. We should take on the yoke of the Heavenly Father Himself. We should be dressed with the rope of righteousness. That is the yoke that the Father is talking about. We should walk in His will and purpose. We read in Numbers 19 verse 6, And the priest shall take seed the wood and hyssop and scarlet and throw them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. So while, like I said earlier, while this red heifer is burning, the priest should add to this fire the cedar wood, hyssop and scarlet, 
And we know from previous studies, this represents you and me. Like I said earlier, this represents our stubbornness, our hard-headedness, our own pride, our own strife, our own will, our own purposes. All of this should be thrown into the fire. It should be consumed by the fire. You see, and we have done a study on the cedarwood, this hyssop and the scarlet yarn previously, but I'll just quickly run through it again, just to, just to remind ourselves again. So cedar trees, as we've discussed in a few weeks ago, grow tall. And it's a very hard wood. It's a long-lasting wood. So this represents our haughtiness, our proudness, our own strife. This represents our sin. It represents rebellion against Abba Yah. So with this thrown into the fire, then we see the picture of us laying ourselves down. We lay our own strength down. We lay our own will, our own actions and purposes, our own hard-headedness. We submit under Abba Yah. Hesop speaks about humbleness and how we should bow our knees like a blade of Hesop. Hesop was used to put the blood on the doorpost. So we see the humbleness of Israel, of you and me, the bride, to submit under the instructions of Abba Yah. Hesop also has medicinal value and cleansing properties which again shows and is a, uh, indicates to you and me what Messiah, our healer and restorer, who he is and what he did on the cross for us. Scarlet yarn, all this scarlet thread represents the, st um, the stain of sin in our lives. We read in Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, says Yah, through your sins, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Can we see this? Cedar wood, hyssop and the scarlet yarn represents our lives, my brother and sister. It represents who we are in this world while we are living for this world. Remember what Messiah said, even though we're in this world, we're not from it. So we do not need to act like it. We do not need to speak like it. We do not need to look like it. We should not conform to it. So cedar, hyssop and scarlet represents you and I not conforming to this world, laying ourselves down so that we can conform to the fire, or to the Father. That's why He is the consuming fire, burning away this, uh, this picture of us conforming to this world. So can we start to see the bigger picture of repentance and purification here? We should humbly submit to Yeshua so we can see how obedience is a sign of humbleness. What a beautiful picture is, uh, are we seeing today that, that laying myself down is a sign of humbleness. We read in Numbers 19 verse 9. And a clean man shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and shall place them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of the children for the water of cleanliness is for cleansing from sin. So here we see the waters of purification and cleansing. So the ashes of the red heifer was mixed with living water. This living water, as we know, was spring water or flowing water. So this was used, this mixture was used for the cleansing and purification. And according to the Torah readings in Numbers 19, when you and I are in the room with a dead person, or we touch the corpse of a dead person, then we become tamay. We become unclean. 
And therefore we're not permitted to enter into the sanctuary. And we know sanctuary is this uh, representation of the presence of the Father. So, so to become clean, we need to be string, uh, sprinkled with this holy water, with this living water, this mixture of ashes and living water. So this would cleanse us. So we had to be sprinkled on the third day and on the seventh day. And then on the sunset of the seventh day, this person, then we would become clean. And then we can go into the presence of the Most High. You see, child of Yahweh, When we become unclean, when we realize it, then we have a way to be restored again. There is a way for you and me to be cleansed and purified again. Abba has supplied us with a way or a means of becoming clean again. And that means our way of cleansing is through His Son, Yeshua. He's the only way. He's the only door. We need to repent. We need to submit under the Father. We need to lay ourselves down so that we can be purified. Messiah bore our sin on Him so that we can be purified. You see, child of God, do we understand and do we realize it is rebellion against the Father not to submit to Him. Do we understand this? It is rebellion against the Most High Father if we do not ask for purification. If we do not ask His Son to cleanse us, to purify us. Therefore He says, my sin will be upon me. My sin becomes my burden if it's not cleansed. In other words, I will pay the price for my own sin. So why apply the waters of purification on the third and on the seventh day? You see, child of Yah, prince and princess of the Most High King, Yeshua rose from the dead on the third day. And, and, and we know that He is the living Torah that gives life. He is the first fruit of the living. He is the living water that washes away our iniquities. And so the sprinkling on the third day is a representation of our lives in Him. That He will raise us up from the dead. He will give us life. He will take us from darkness into light. And why the seventh day? You see, the seventh day is a picture of fullness. Seven, as we know, is the fullness of, 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 of Yah. In other words, nothing more is needed. It is also a picture of relationship, where we find rest on the seventh day, where we get restored to his shalom on the seventh day. The seventh day represents his rest, his Sabbath, his shalom and his presence. So to sum it up, the third day is testifying about the resurrection of Yeshua and also our resurrection in Him, our sanctification in Him. And the seventh day is a picture of our commitment to life. It's a picture of we the bride in relationship with Him. It's a picture of us and our commitment to the Shabbat, to the Sabbath, to the Father Himself. You see, He is the living water. He's the one that gives life. We all know the story of the Samaritan woman that we read in John 4. So read with me John 4, 9 to 10. And the Samaritan woman asked him, how is it that you being a Jew, speaking to Messiah now, how is it that you being a Jew ask me, a Samaritan woman, for drink, for water? For the Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. And Yeshua answered her, if you knew 
the gift of life, if you knew the gift from the Father, if you knew about eternal life, and who it is who says, give me drink, you would have asked him instead to give you living water. To give you this internal life. Oh, this is what this Messiah Yeshua is, is telling this woman. I am the living water. Just like he's the bread of life. He's the bread from heaven. He's the manna in the wilderness. He is the living water. We read in John 7, 37. And on that day, that last day, that great day of the festival, Yeshua stood and cried and saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and let him who believes in me come and drink. Brothers and sisters, go to him. Drink for Messiah. Jeremiah 2, verse 12 to 13. Be amazed, O heavens. At this and be frightened, be utterly dried up, declares Yah. For my people have done two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountains of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, cracked cisterns, which do not hold water. What is he saying here, my brothers and sisters? Abba is saying, do not make cisterns for yourself. Do not follow men. Do not follow your own selfish desires. I was saying, do not trust in your own strength, but trust in me. I was saying, do not follow uh, the worship of men. Follow him, worship him. You see, he's the living water. Ask and I will give you. That's what he's saying. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, Oh, yeah. The expectation of Israel, all who forsake you are put to shame. Those who depart from me shall be written in earth, in the earth, because they have forsaken Yah, the fountain of living waters. We read in Leviticus 22 verse 9, And they shall guard my charge, lest they bear sin for it, and die thereby when they profane it. And Yah, I am I, Yah, set them apart. My brothers and sisters, the law is the falling. That if we become unclean, then we defile the tabernacle. You see, child of Yah, we might be unclean, but there's a way of purification for you and me. Because in our uncleanliness, in our defilement, we cannot have a relationship with the Father. You see, because in our uncleanliness, in our defilements, in this tamai state that we are in, we are removed from the light of the Father. We are removed from His presence. Therefore, we cannot, we cannot be in relationship with Him. So you and I, if we declare ourselves to be children of the Most High, if we declare ourselves to be so-called Christians, then how can we live defiled lives? How can we then stay unclean? You and I need to put and lay ourselves down on the altar with Messiah. You see, our stubbornness, our uh, pride and our strife needs to be thrown into this fire so that we can conform to Messiah, so that we can become more like Him. You see, His image should be inside me and inside you. His light should be inside me. And inside you. Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the favorable gift of Allah is everlasting life in Messiah Yeshua, our Master. The gift of life, my brothers and sisters, is for you and me to conform to Him, to conform to His likeness, to conform to His light, to become who He is. Let's pray.
most high and set apart father abba thank you thank you for this week father thank you for life thank you that you are the giver of life that you are the sustainer of life father yeah you are you are righteousness therefore it is my prayer today for myself for my family for your bride father that we shall conform to your son that How about that we shall conform to the likeness of your Son? Therefore, it's my prayer that you, that we shall lay ourselves down, Father, our hard-headedness, our stubbornness, our own pride, our own selfish needs and wants and acts, our lustful desires. Abba, may this be the, the prayer of your bride your remnant people, your set-apart people, Father, to lay themselves down so that we can be burned away, so that the crookedness can be burned away, so that our rebellious lives can be burned away, so that our sin against you, Father, can be burned away by your purification fire, by your consuming fire, Father. Thank you for this picture of the red heifer and the ashes. Thank you for your son as we read today like like the sheep that's silent father your son was silent and he took the penalty of sin upon him and he paid the price he paid this redemptive price for for us father thank you for your son thank you for the everlasting life thank you that he rose from the dead on the third day, thank you that we now can have life, that we can move from darkness to light, that we can move from death to life, the life that you give. May this be our prayer, Father. That's why I'm asking today that this word, this truth of yours, that it will resonate inside us, Abba, that it will become a living word, that your Ruach will speak to us, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, will guide us and will teach us your truth. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the Shabbat. Thank you that we can enter into your rest. Thank you that we can just be quiet so that you can speak to us. That's my prayer for the Shabbat. Father, I praise you and I honor you and I declare that you are the Most High and, and there is none like you and there will never be anything like you. There will be there's only one king of kings. There's only one master of the universe and that's you. Therefore I praise you and I honor you. And I declare today that you are my king, my master, my savior, my redeemer. In your mighty name, Yeshua. Thank you. Amen. Receive this blessing from the Father. Yevrechecha Yahua vi Ishmerecha. Yaer Yahua Pana Velecha. Vichunecha. Yesa Yahua Pana Veleka. Vyasem Lecha Shalom. My brothers and sisters, Abba Yah bless you and keep you. The Father will make his face shine upon you and, and he'll be gracious to you. Abba Yah lifts up his countenance upon you and your family and he gives you peace. Shalom, shalom.